Hi everyone, welcome to Full Plate Living's uh, workshop today. We are very excited to do a women's health workshop um, with Dr. Michelle Tollefson. Hi, Michelle. Hello. Glad to have you here today. Dr. Tollefson is, um, wait until I read her bio. Um, but first, of course, this is technology. So Michelle is gonna be helping us with that today. So I'm gonna hand it off to her for a few things there. And that would be me, Michelle Jones, the other Michelle on the call. <laughs> so I see that you have all found the chat. Please tell us where you're from, say hello. And during the workshop, use the chat to ask any questions. I know when we're talking about important health issues that questions pop up, go ahead and ask them. And then at the end, we will go through as many of the questions as we can. We wanna be mindful of your time. So with all of that, I'm ready to turn it over to you ladies. Fantastic, thank you, Michelle. Um, we, as I said, we are so glad to have you here today. We are really excited about um, sharing this workshop of improving women's midlife health with a whole food uh, plant predominant diet. And so kind of what does that mean with full plate and all the um, wonderful things we get to experience as women. <laughs> so I'm going to read through uh, Dr. Tollison's bio real quick because she has done some very impressive things and continues to do some very impressive things. And so just to kind of give you an idea of, um, of her professional background, she is a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. She's a certified diplomat of the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, she's a fellow of um, American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and she actually is an obst obstetrician gynecologist in Denver, Colorado, and a professor of health professions department at the Metropolitan State University of Denver, where she created and oversees the lifestyle medicine program and the wellness coaching and lifestyle medicine pathway. So she, you can tell she's already very much um, in the lifestyle medicine and uh, you know health in general. So I absolutely um, love that. She's a graduate of Creighton University where she received both her bachelor of science and doctor of medicine degrees. She completed an um, obstetrics and gynecology residency at the University of Missouri in Kansas City and received her board certification in this specialty. She also received her board certification for the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine and fellowship for um, the lifestyle medicine for ACLM. And actually, that's actually where I uh, uh, first kind of really uh, was like, we need Dr. Tolleson to do this was uh, attending that the ACLM conference. So I'm super excited about um, being able to have you here, for, um, you know, just from that experience. Um, but she's done a lot with American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, it's a field of women's lifestyle medicine specifically. She founded and co-chairs the ACLM Women's Health Member Interest Group, as well as the Pre-Professional Lifestyle Medicine Education Member Interest Group. She serves as the ACLM Executive Board Secretary and serves on the Education and Membership Committees. She's the Editor-in-Chief of Improving Women's Health Across the Lifespan, an international speaker, women's health consultant, um, and she leads Paving the Pathway to Wellness groups and recently co-authored the Paving the Path to Wellness workbook with Dr. Beth Brady's and Dr. Amy, is it Commander? Is that how she pronounces her last name? It is. Excellent. She is currently writing a menopause and lifestyle medicine book to hopefully be released in late 2022. I know I'm looking forward to getting that one. Um, you know, what's impressive is that she is a breast cancer survivor and thriver through the power of lifestyle medicine, and she enjoys spending time in the Colorado outdoors with her husband and three children. So she is quite a lady, as you can all tell, and we are super excited, as I said, to have you here with us today, Dr. Tollison. Oh, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today. I'm excited to to share some information with um, you and all of your listeners. So thank Excellent. you. We're going to pop off and we're going to hand it over to you. Um, but if you know this is technology, so if something happens, just give us a second. Let us kind of um, come back on. Um, but we'll be in the chat. So if you have questions, ask ask those there, and we'll hand it off to you. Great. Yes, please ask questions. I'm happy to answer answer any question to the best of my abilities. So, improving women's midlife health with a whole food plant predominant diet. So I really didn't think a lot about nutrition for the first 20 or so years of my life. My mom cooked meals with ingredients from my dad's garden. And so I ate pretty, a pretty healthy diet growing up. But then I got to medical school and residency when healthy eating became more challenging. I didn't really cook meals for myself. I ate from the cafeteria. 
And when I was in residency, our cafeteria actually was closed late at night. And um, so I was on the weekends and I would do those 24 hour plus shifts delivering babies. And so the middle of the night, I would sometimes go down to our hospital basement where we had a McDonald's and I would stand in line with my patients who were sometimes holding or pushing their IV poles and, and try to order something that was maybe kind of healthy, but, but it was a challenge. I ate um, a lot of uh, meals that the drug representatives brought in that weren't always the most healthy and drank a lot of soda to stay awake to stay awake overnight. So my eating was not healthy for my medical school and time in residency. So I got out of residency and was in private practice and I thought now I'm able to focus on my health. And so I really started going back to nutrition. I'd always been interested in nutrition, but I really started diving into the literature to try to learn more about what the literature showed was the best way to move forward with nutrition. Because as I'm guessing many of you, it can get, um, sometimes it's confusing to hear all the different studies and one day we should eat this and the next day we should eat that, all those conflicting studies. So I dove into the research and it was really guiding me toward eating more whole foods and eating more plants. The more I started embracing this type of eating myself and for my family, the better I felt. The more I would learn and dive into the literature, the more I shared with my patients, they started to feel better. And so it was just kind of this, like a, a good snowball that happened. It just, um, it continued to move forward with me feeling healthier and better and um, my patients as well. So I felt like I had found a new superpower in nutrition, which was really exciting considering that I didn't get very much nutrition education in medical school. On average, doctors get about two hours, only two hours a year in nutrition education during their training. So this was my new superpower. I was feeling great three young kids, life was going well. Until a few years ago, when I had a routine mammogram, no symptoms and no significant risk factors, and found a two centimeter breast cancer mass that was invading my chest wall, which I fought with 16 rounds of dose dense chemotherapy. You can see me, see me there. Chemotherapy, seven surgeries. Um, I had, had to have some reconstruction as well due to the type of, the type of cancer. And, um, and a whole food plant predominant diet. So I became even more passionate about sharing this message with everybody who could listen. I feel like it's an area that, that women need to, to hear more about and need to know more about the literature and how this can impact their lives. So that's a little bit about my nutrition story, but today I'm here to hopefully help you with your nutrition story. So starting out with where we're at right now, it's, it's, hard, to be, it's hard to eat healthy in America. Um, our food is nutrient poor and calorie dense. It is fast, it is supersized, it's formulated to be addictive and available 24 seven. Over half of American women go on a diet each year and the $70 billion weight loss industry is more than eager to tell us what we should and shouldn't eat, practicing quick fixes and miracle diets that usually leave us heavier than we were before. If you look at this, um, if you look at this graph, you see on the left that about two thirds of women get more than 10% of their daily calories from added sugar. So this isn't the healthy sugar in fruit or fructose. This is from added sugar. So more than 10% of everything they're eating every day comes from added sugar. And over 70% of women get more than 10% of their daily calories from saturated fat. And saturated fat comes from animal products. And we know that higher levels of saturated fat intake are not good for our health as well. So we're in a rough spot when it comes to looking at our nation as a whole with women and what we eat. I want to try to make this as simple as possible though, so I'm going to share some broad overarching nutrition thoughts with you before we get um, go into some specifics about the gut microbiome and menopause and um, breast, can uh, breast cancer risk reduction and sexual health and bone health and brain health. So some overarching thoughts and themes for this are the importance of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains, as those of you who, who follow Ardmore know that these are super important um, to include on our healthy plate. So women on average eat less than two cups of vegetables a day when the recommendation and the dietary guidelines for Americans are that women get at least two to three cups of vegetables daily. Women on average get less than one cup of fruit a day, though the recommendation is to eat at least one and a half to two cups of fruit each day. Also, the recommendations are for Americans or for women to get about five servings of grains a day and to make most of those whole grains. But American women get less than one serving of whole grains each day. Most of the grains are those highly processed grains. And so this is damaging to our health. Just if we made these changes, just if we increased our vegetable fruit intake and made our grains whole grains, we would see a drastic improvement. 
also, I'm sure you've heard Ardmore talk about how fabulous fiber is, but I believe fabulous is fi fat, fiber is fabulous for females. 95% of Americans don't get enough fiber. We are fiber starved. The average American woman gets about 12 grams of fiber a day, which is about half of the recommended amount. Women under 50, the recommendation is that they get 25 to 28 grams of fiber a day, and over 50, about 22 grams of fiber. Now, fiber is found only in plants. It's part of what helps the plants stand upright and gives them structure. There is no fiber in animal products. So if we're thinking of, of um, milk and cheese and eggs and uh, meat, there's no fiber in that. We have to look to our plants for fiber. And for some reference, people are like, well, I don't know how much fiber am I getting? I encourage you all to do a fiber diary, like a 24-hour fiber diary, and just see where you're at on a typical day. Now, when you buy broccoli from the store, it's not going to have a label that says this much fiber is in a cup of broccoli. And so you'll need to do, um, you'll need to do some searching on the internet to find out how much fiber is in some of your healthiest products. But look to see where you're at. Um, a a cup of lentils or a cup of um, like black beans is about 15 grams of fiber and um, a cup of broccoli or a medium-sized apple is about five grams of fiber. If you're struggling with getting enough fiber, there are also some really fiber-dense cereals that you can eat that have like 15 to 17 grams of fiber in a half cup. But if you need to increase your fiber, start low and go slow. And I recommend that you get your fiber from foods because then you get all the benefits of the phytonutrients and the antioxidants that are important for health. So check out that fiber. So in making food choices, the overarching themes that we'll talk about today are make sure that they're nutrient rich. You want foods that are giving you nutrients. So this is that rainbow that you see on here of the rainbow of foods. Um, all the different, the pigments go along with different antioxidants and phytonutrients. And so you want to eat a rainbow of foods. You want to eat foods that are whole or minimally processed. You want to be able to tell what they were when they were grown. Um, if you think about some of our chips, like I don't know what that was when it came out of the ground. Like what, what went into that or candy? Like what did that come from? Um, is it made with... Is it made with some dairy? Is it made with some, some wheat? I, I don't know. So you want things that are whole or minimally processed. You want foods that are anti-inflammatory. And if you're eating nutrient-rich, whole or minimally processed foods, such as fruits and vegetables and beans and seeds and nuts, those are going to be nutrient-rich, um, anti-inflammatory foods, and then foods that are filled with fiber. All of those go together. So we're not going to be talking about one diet for menopause and one diet for bone health today. Um, I'm going to show you some of the specifics with those different, those different conditions, but really these are the overarching goals that go beautifully with what Ardmore is teaching you as well. So first I wanna talk a little bit about the gut microbiome because I get excited about the gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome are just the trillions of bacteria that live in all of our intestines. And they are vital, vital, vital for our health. We have to take care of these trillions of bacteria because they do so much for us. And more research is just continuing to come out about its importance. If we don't feed these trillions of bacteria with healthy foods, they can't do what they need to do in order to keep us healthy. Now, I know that this is a complicated slide, it's from a journal, but I wanted you to really understand the importance of feeding that gut microbiome with those healthy foods, the foods that are in that 75% of that Ardmore plate. So on the left side, this is showing you a cross section of, of the intestine. So on the top, you see where it says diet and fiber. So that's the food that's coming in. And um, the lumen is like is the, the opening of the intestines. The epithelium is the, the lining of the intestines or the intestinal wall. And then um, the systemic circulation would be the blood vessels that wrap around our intestines that take the, the nutrients and the nourishment um, from the food and then put it throughout our body. So on the left side is what we want to happen. We want to feed our bacteria with that diet and that fiber that makes um, our bacteria really happy. They replicate, they, they produce a nice thick mucus layer. You can see that yellow on top, um, it says mucus layer. We want that. That mucus layer helps to keep what's in the intestines, what's in our stool moving through. We do not want things that should not be seeping through to our circulation to seep through. We want that nice thick mucus layer. Also, when our bacteria digest and ferment that um, the food that has a lot of fiber, they produce short chain fatty acids. And these actually impact our mood, which is so cool. Some really great research around short chain fatty acids and mood. They help us with our immunity. They help us with metabolism. They decrease our risk for cancer. So these are really important. We need to feed our bacteria. 
if we don't on the right side is what we call dysbiosis and that's when when you have kind of like a, a sick or a not as healthy gut microbiome if we don't feed our microbiome those fiber rich foods so example for example if i'm eating a lot of processed food i'm eating um white bread and, and some rice white rice and um and i'm eating a lot of processed food and a lot of animal products and i'm not getting that fiber um, then I'll get what's called bacterial dysbiosis. I don't have that thick mucus layer and I don't get all those short chain fatty acids. So I don't get that benefit. And then also things can seep through through the intestines to the systemic circulation that shouldn't be seeping through. Um, once again, we want that mucus layer to keep everything that's in the stool moving through like it's supposed to. So that's why it's so important to nourish our gut microbiome. So on the left, you can see those would be foods that would nourish our gut microbiome, right? Fruits and vegetables and whole grains and nuts and beans and seeds. On the right, that would not nourish our gut microbiome. That's ultra processed food that is not nourishing. It's not that you can't have any of that or any animal products. It's just that we need to make sure that we're eating that at least 75% of our plate where we're eating those nourishing foods to really take care of our microbiome so that they can take care of us. It becomes even more important as we get older. We can't control aging and we can't control our genetics, but we can control what we put into our mouth. And as we get older, as we go through menopause, our microbiome changes and it becomes um, kind of what I would explain as more fragile. It becomes more delicate and it needs kind of extra tender loving care in order to stay healthy. So we have to be even more mindful about the foods that we're putting into our body because if we don't take care of our microbiome and we get dysbiosis, it actually increases the risk um, of many of our chronic lifestyle conditions like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and dementia like Alzheimer's. So it's important um, what we put into our body. Now prebiotics are just the food that we give our bacteria that they can digest and ferment in order to produce these short chain fatty acids and do all these fabulous things for us. And there are pretty much any fiber rich, nutrient rich food, whole food is going to be a prebiotic, but these are some that your bacteria absolutely love. They have a party when you give them these foods. So if you can try to incorporate um, some of these every day or, or as often as you can, onions, that really whole grain bread, not the, not, um, I mean, sometimes the, the breads even will say whole grain, but you flip them over and look at the label and they'll have very little fiber. So a fiber rich whole grain bread, um, artichokes, leeks, soybeans. I'm a huge fan of soy. We'll talk more about that later, but soybeans, bananas, garlic, those are all great prebiotics that your bacteria love. And then many of you have probably heard of probiotics. They are supplements that you see in the store. I'm not a fan of supplements. Um, altogether, I'm not a fan of supplements unless it's something that your doctor is recommending for a specific purpose, um, such as probiotics for that. But otherwise, I recommend you get your probiotics from food. And probiotic food are fermented products that have those live bacteria that can help nourish our microbiome. And so kefir and yogurt are fermented um, milk products, but you can also get plant-based yogurt, which I love, sauerkraut, fermented cabbage, miso is a fermented soy product that's like a paste that's used in some delicious soups. Pickles, and if you're getting pickles for its probiotic impact, they'll probably be in the refrigerated section and they won't have vinegar because vinegar is going to kill the bacteria. So pickles, um, tempeh, which is a fermented soy product often used as a meat replacement. You can look for recipes if you just put in tempeh. Um, tempeh recipes, you'll find some great recipes and then kombucha, a fermented tea drink. So I recommend getting your probiotics that way. So menopause, let's dive into menopause. When I went through um, chemotherapy with my first chemotherapy, and then I had a surgery to remove my ovaries because of the type of breast cancer I had, um, I went through menopause about a decade earlier than I was planning on going through it. But I am now passionate about looking at everything I can regarding nutrition and menopause and healthy lifestyle in general and menopause. So as I mentioned, the microbiome changes during that perimenopausal time period as our hormones start to go up and down um, and then moving toward menopause. So it's even more important to prioritize healthy eating. I wanna share a couple of my favorite um, research studies with you. This is a research study that involved, um, it came out last year, it involved over 100,000 women, um, menopausal women, they followed them for 20 years. So 20 years following 100,000 women. And what they found um, was that the people who ate the most plant protein, that they had lower risk of cardiovascular disease, so heart and vessel disease, they also had a lower risk of premature and dementia-related death. And, and I think we probably all have known somebody who has Alzheimer's or a type of dementia. Um, so, and we want to do everything we can to protect our, our brain health. So the more plant protein they ate, the better, um, the better they did. Also, those people who ate the most processed meats or when they would eat more processed meats had higher risk of dementia 
related death. So processed meat we know is really dangerous. That's actually considered a carcinogen. So processed meat is like your bacon and ham and lunch meat and hot dogs. We want to avoid processed meat. Um, the people who substituted red meat, um, eggs or dairy products with nuts had a lower risk of death. So those are all reasons why, it's not saying that we can't eat any animal protein. If you're somebody who eats animal protein, it's not that you can't have any of that. You can put that on the 25% of your plate, right? Um, but if you, if, you do eat, if you do eat meat and other sources of um, animal protein, you want to try to limit that or at least try to incorporate some, some plant protein. Aim for 20 to 25 grams of high quality protein per meal. And so for example, 20 to 25 grams of high quality protein per meal, that'd be like a cup of tofu or a cup of, a cup of edamame or those soybeans. Um, and so aim for 20 to 25 uh, grams of high quality protein per meal about three times a day. And our plant protein rich foods are lentils, which you can see here. Another great way if you're like, how do I cook with lentils? I'm, Ardmore probably has some recipes that you can look at that um, incorporate lentils, or you can go and just, just go on Pinterest or Google and search for, for lentil recipes, healthy lentil recipes, and um, cook with those, or beans. Tofu, I cook with tofu all the time in my refrigerator and right now I have some tofu sticks that my kids just love. Uh, edamame is um, the soybeans that you can pop out of their pods. I steam edamame all the time. Um, I'll take it and just put it in, steam it or I'll put it in my microwave. And then my kids and I love popping it out of the pods. I love a little bit of salt on it. Um, absolutely a delicious snack. Broccoli, quinoa, oats, nuts, chia and hemp seeds, all great sources of plant protein. So I encourage you to try to get more plant protein in your diet. Also, I get tons of questions about menopause and soy. And soy is, um, I recommend though, when you're trying to eat soy, that you use minimally processed soy. So I don't recommend the soy supplements or the soy powder. I recommend that you get it from minimally processed foods such as edamame. So those are those soybeans that you can pop out of the pods or get them pre um, taken out of the pod. Uh, soy nuts, tofu, tempeh, um, miso, that's that fermented soy paste or soy milk. There's been some research showing that about a cup of tofu or a cup of um, a cup of soy milk a day decreases hot flashes by as much as like 30 to 50 percent. There's some women who it doesn't benefit, unfortunately, and that might be because of the makeup of the bacteria in their gut microbiome. But a lot of women do see a significant improvement in hot flashes and night sweats. It might help with vaginal blood flow and lubrication, which is beneficial since vaginal dryness is so common during menopause and might help with muscle pain too. So I recommend, um, I recommend incorporating some soy, um, going with those foods. Soy is a phytoestrogen, so it stimulates some of our estrogen receptors, but kind of in a different way than the, the estrogen does. And it's also safe for breast cancer survivors. We used to be concerned about that, but now we know it's actually beneficial for breast cancer survivors too. There was another great research study that came out last um, year by Dr. Neil Barnard, and they took menopausal women who were all having hot flashes, and half of them did their regular diet, and the other half did a low-fat vegan diet with a half a cup of whole cooked soybeans daily. And what they found is that it decreased significantly their number of hot flashes, and what's really cool is that almost 60% of the women had no moderate to severe hot flashes in the group that did that low fat vegan diet with the soybeans. It also improved their menopause related quality of life symptoms, which are a variety, a variety of symptoms. So, uh, so eating a diet that has some soy in it and that is plant predominant uh, and lower in fat can be, it can be so beneficial for your health. Now, when people ask me, what should I do as far as diet for nights, um, hot flashes and night sweats? And I, I have tried this myself as somebody who has gotten to experience this earlier than I, I wanted to, but um, it's important to stay well hydrated. There's some research showing that even a mild dehydration can trigger hot flashes for some people. And I recommend doing a diary and seeing what triggers them for you because what triggers hot flashes for you may not trigger them for me. Eating some soy foods, being mindful of alcohol, caffeine, hot beverages, and spicy foods, those can trigger hot flashes and night sweats in some people, getting those plant protein rich foods, eating some omega-3 fatty acids like flax seeds, nuts, and they're also in seafood. Um, if you do get them from flax seeds, you want ground flax seeds because otherwise if they're whole flax seeds, you won't get the full benefit. And you can buy them ground now um, at so many places, um, or you can grind them yourself if you want to. Getting enough calcium, eating a whole food plant predominant diet or a Mediterranean diet that has a lot of a lot of plant foods and then avoiding the sugar cycle. For some people, that sugar rise and sugar crash um, from the added sugar can trigger hot flashes and night sweats. Plus, it's not good for our health overall. 
So brain health, we want to keep our brain as healthy as possible. And when I think of brain health, I think of smoothies because I do um, weekends. I make up, my husband and I make up smoothies for each of us for every day of the week. And we freeze all of it so that we can just put it in a container and add our soy milk to it and, and have it easy in the morning with uh, minimal preparation. But in my smoothies, I always have a rainbow of fruits and vegetables. So I um, always have blueberries because blueberries, I believe have the most research around them as far as, as far as a fruit and brain health. So I always have blueberries, plus I love them. Frozen blueberries, I have some frozen strawberries. I also put a frozen banana in there. So I put my rainbow of fruits. I always have leafy greens in it, some spinach. I throw some leafy greens in there. I also have omega-3 fatty acids because I always put like a tablespoon or tablespoon and a half of ground flax seeds. And then I put in, I get my soy too. So I put in some soy milk and, and, um, and make that. So that's my smoothie, my smoothie in the morning, but also walnuts and almonds. I try to snack on a few of these every day. Those are good for brain health, extra virgin olive oil, cooking with foods that have a lot of spices, of course, getting your whole grains and beans and peas. Those are all super beneficial for brain health, which is, um, which is so important. So let's move on to bone health. We know that peak bone mass occurs earlier in life, um, like uh, late teens, early 20s is our kind of peak bone mass. And after that, it starts to go downhill gradually. But at menopause, we see a steep decline. And so it's really important that we do everything we can to support our bone health through a healthy diet. It's important to get enough vitamin D. Um, it's sometimes in foods that are, are um, fortified with it. So I also recommend doing a calcium and a vitamin D diary to see how much intake you're getting of both of these. We need vitamin D to help with calcium absorption. And you probably think of dairy products when you think of calcium and there is calcium in dairy products. There's also a lot of calcium in many of your plant based milk products. Um, so I would encourage you to check them out the next time you're you know, purchasing it. If you're going to try cashew milk or almond milk or soy milk, those are three types of milk I actually have in my refrigerator right now. I have that whole variety. Um, but check to see how much calcium is in there. There's a lot of calcium in many of our, our plant-based milks as well. You can also get calcium rich foods such as your green leafy vegetables, our rock star vegetables, broccoli, garbanzo beans, and seeds. So make sure you're getting enough calcium. And if you're not getting at least 1200 milligrams of calcium in your food and at least um, about 600 to 800 international units of vitamin D a day, I recommend that you talk to your doctor about potential supplementation. There's risks and benefits of supplementation. You can get a vitamin D level checked. So make sure that you talk to your doctor about that. But for bone health, I encourage fruits and vegetables, research on that, getting enough magnesium. So that comes from seeds and nuts and leafy greens, vitamin K, again, from leafy greens and broccoli, folate, not surprisingly, leafy greens, peanuts, beans, and fruit, getting some carotenoid rich foods. So these are the foods that are red and orange and yellow vegetables. They're also beneficial for decreasing the risk of breast cancer. So I, and I'd encourage you to try to get some carotenoid rich foods every day, eat some red, orange, or yellow fruits and vegetables every day. Phytate rich foods are good for bone health, such as nuts, seeds, whole grains, and legumes. And then getting adequate but not excessive protein. There's kind of this thing in, in the United States where we think we need tons of protein, um, but we don't need excessive amounts of protein. Um, you don't need a giant steak in order to get enough protein. Getting adequate protein but not excessive. And then possibly tea fermented foods and omega-3 fatty acids, though we need more research in that area. And then I want you to avoid or limit foods that go along with these, the picture that's here. And I know those donuts look good, fries and chips and hamburgers um, and candy, but try to avoid or limit these. Keep these to that 25% of your plate and possibly even less if you're able to do so. The foods that we call the Western dietary patterns, people also call it the SAD diet, the standard American diet that is rich in highly processed foods, foods with a lot of added sugar, um, candy, cookies, um, chips, um, our processed meats, that's your Western dietary pattern. Avoid excessive protein and salt. Avoid fast food, especially that the fried food. And if you are get at a fast food place, ch check out to see what they have that's healthy. There are a lot of great um, options now at restaurants for healthier food. So look to see what plant-based protein options you have or um, see what the healthier options are. Glycotoxins, try to avoid those or limit those. And that um, those occur when plant-based protein is cooked, often like that charring that you'll see. So like if you have a, a grilled hamburger, kind of that charring that you see, those are glycotoxins. Those are not good for bones. And so if you are someone who eats meat, I encourage you to cook it in, um, if you're able to cook it in a more of a moist cooking method, such as boiling um, chicken instead of, instead of um, uh, frying it or um, putting it on the grill. And then also the moisture methods, uh, give you fewer glycotoxins as do cooking it at a lower temperature and for a shorter amount of time. 
though you want to make sure that, of course, your meat is fully cooked for food safety reasons. Avoid soda, horrible for bones, excessive alcohol, which is considered more than three servings a day, or for this, for bones. Um, it's actually recommended that we don't have more than one serving a day of alcohol for women. Um, and excessive coffee, so not more than three cups a day of coffee for bone health. Now let's talk a little bit about cancer. So diet and nutrition probably contribute to about 20 to 60% of cancers worldwide. And so for redu reducing the risk of cancer, once again, a lot of the same guidelines or a lot of the same foods we've already talked about, they're that 75% portion um, of your Ardmore plate. But you want to include more whole grains, non-starchy vegetables, fruits, beans, and lentils. So try recipes with these, Get um, eat these whole foods, eat things that are minimally processed with these, cook with these. Um, eat a diet that's high in all types of plant food, including at least five servings. So I would encourage you to aim for at least five servings of fruits and vegetables every single day of non-starchy vegetables and fruits. And then eat it, they recommend for cancer risk reduction, getting at least 30 grams of fiber from food sources. So keep that fiber diary, see where you're at and if you need to increase it. But if you need to increase it, just do it gradually so you don't end up with some GI problems from um, increasing it too fast. And then this picture probably looks familiar. It's I wanted to tie in that, that a lot of the things we're saying to avoid aren't avoiding just for bone health. You're avoiding them for, for um, to decrease your risk of cancer as well and so many other chronic conditions. So limit red meat and consume very little, if any, processed meat. That processed meat is a carcinogen. It increases the risk of cancer. That's your hot dogs, your bacon, your... Um, your uh, lunch meat, that processed meat. Limit fast foods and other processed foods, high in fat, starches and that added sugar. Avoid sugar sweetened drinks and alcohol. Um, sugar sweetened drinks, so like soda, but also fruit juices often have a lot of extra added sugar. Um, try to meet your nutritional needs through diet and not supplements. I wish that there were a magic pill I could tell you about today, but I can't. Supplements do not do the work that you can, um, that are the benefits that we can get through a whole food plant predominant diet, no matter what they say. Supplements just can't do what diet can do for you. And then as a breast cancer survivor, um, speaking to women, I want to give you information because I don't want you to join the breast cancer club that I am part of. I want you to stay breast cancer free. And if you are a breast cancer survivor like me, then these guidelines should help with um, decreasing the risk of recurrence as well. So eat a plant predominant diet, eat lots of plants, not that you can't do some other things, but eat a plant predominant diet, get a lot of fiber, eat carotenoid rich foods, those are those red, orange, and yellow foods, Enjoy cruciferous vegetables. So I try to get some broccoli sprouts every day, but broccoli sprouts, um, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, get some cruciferous vegetables. Enjoy soy foods, limit your saturated fat. So limit the um, fat that comes from animal products or limit, um, and if you are, if you are like, um, if you do use dairy, try to get low fat or fat-free dairy products. If you do, um, if you are eating meat, try to eat um, meat cuts of meat that have less fat on them, and then limit or avoid alcohol. So sexual health, I want to cover this real briefly. I don't think that this is discussed enough in women's health, but um, a Western dietary pattern, so once again, what you see in that picture, is indirectly linked with sexual dysfunction, and about 45% of all women experience sexual dysfunction, and that increases after menopause. When we talk about sexual dysfunction, we're talking about a decreased interest in sexual activity that is bothersome for a woman. Um, it can be problems with sexual arousal and also um, discomfort or pain during intercourse. It's not always due to diet, so see your, see your gynecologist, your primary care doctor, if you're having these problems, actually like any medical problem, but we know that food, um, that there's a connection there with food. So a sexual health promoting diet, the one that we have the most research on is a Mediterranean diet, a Mediterranean diet that has lots of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and nuts and seeds, all of those things. And they usually have some seafood or fish as well. Um, if there's meat, it's limited. If there's dairy, it's limited. If there's eggs, it's limited. Or a whole food plant predominant diet, which by its nature will be antioxidant rich, getting adequate iron, staying low in saturated fat, low in the fat that comes from animal products, and low in refined carbohydrates. That's your white bread, your white rice, your white pasta, your chips, the things that are um, refined uh, carbohydrates that aren't your whole, whole grains. So lastly, I just, um, even though we focus more on women's health conditions, I just want to briefly mention uh, the guidelines that came out around cardiovascular health because 
as I've said before, the diet that we we're talking about, the Ardmore diet, isn't just good for one condition. It's good for across the spectrum for most women and most health conditions. There's a few GI conditions um, with exceptions. In that case, if you have a GI condition, you know, talk to your doctor and maybe see a registered dietitian. I'm a fan of seeing registered dietitians to help you with um, improving your diet at any point in time. I'd love for all of you to have conversations with your, with your primary care doctor, with your doctor about, um, about nutrition. But there are these guidelines that came out from the American Heart Association last year that are showing um, the same thing we've been talking about, about emphasizing fruits and vegetables and whole grains. If you're um, getting, getting healthy sources of protein, so they say fish and seafood, legumes, so your beans and nuts. If you're going to do dairy, they recommend low fat or fat-free dairy, poultry, and if, and if desired, other lean meat. You don't need lean meat, um, but if you are going to incorporate meat, um, if you're not a vegetarian or vegan, um, try to get lean cuts of meat. And then liquid plant oil. So avoiding your butter and your margarine and your tropic oils like um, coconut oil or your palm oil. We're trying to get the liquid plant oils. And then minimize, on the other side, minimize. This is what the Ardmore plate is saying. It's not saying that you can't ever have ice cream. Oh my goodness, if somebody told me I couldn't ever have ice cream, I would be, um, I would be so sad. But actually, actually, I think that, and I saw this in one of the Ardmore communications, you can do nice cream with, um, with frozen bananas and, and some strawberries. So anyway, minimize beverages and foods with added sugars ultra processed foods, the foods that don't look like they what they were when they grew out of the ground, processed meats, foods high in salt, alcoholic beverages, and tropic oils. And then at the bottom, they say the importance of adjusting energy intake to have a healthy body weight and following this guidance wherever food is prepared or served. So when you go out to a restaurant, look for the options of things that have um, plant protein, look for things that are lower in fat, look for um, healthy options because they're out there. You may have to talk to your waitress or your server, but, um, but go ahead and, and look for things that give you, uh, the, that are nourishing. You wanna look for foods that are nourishing for you, um, that really nourish your body with each bite. So I've shared a lot of information uh, with you about healthy food choices, but it's all about making healthy eating a re reality for you. I can have all the literature in the world, but if I can't, um, if I can't do it in a way that brings me joy, where I am enjoying what I'm eating, and it fits in with my crazy schedule with my three kids, then it's not going to be a reality for me. And I want this to be a reality for you because that's that's my my goal. That's um, my passion is trying to get the message out to people and help them lead healthier, happier lives. So when I tell people about eating more plant protein and eating a lot of, a lot of um, plants, um, they often tell me that there are three concerns they have. First, they're like, oh, how is this going to taste? I don't, I don't want to eat things that don't taste good. They're worried about convenience. This is going to take tons of time. I don't have tons of time to make these elaborate recipes. And then cost, this is going to be expensive. Those are the three concerns I hear the most of, so I'm going to address those um, with you, those three right now. So for taste. Um, go explore recipes, go on a treasure hunt to see what you can find. Um, go to a bookstore or a library and look at cookbooks, um, buy cookbooks. But you can also go on Pinterest. Pinterest is one of my favorite places. I'll put in lentils and um, lentils and inexpensive, if I wanna make an inexpensive lentil meal, or I'll put in tempeh if I'm feeling like that, or, or tofu, um, Asian, if I wanna find like an, an Asian dish. Um, and that has that, that flavor, that inspiration that has tofu and you come up with fabulous recipes. So explore, um, explore cookbooks, explore different recipes to see what you like. Um, what you like won't necessarily be what I like. So explore different things, try different things and know that it's a process. Your taste buds and your taste will change, but it takes some time. Um, talk to your dietitian, talk to your doctor, see if they have recommendations for you. Some medications can also change how things taste. So consider that. Cook with herbs, especially if you can get fresh herbs, but even dried herbs, cook with herbs and try different spices. Um, oh my goodness, the spices can, can really add so much flavor to your food. I don't like like hot spicy, like my mouth is burning. I don't like that kind of spice, but the flavors that you can get um, and try different types of cuisine. I never knew that I liked um, that I liked uh, Indian cuisine. I never knew that I really liked um, Native American cuisine until I started trying to cook some of those recipes and incorporate some of their spices and plant protein, and they are absolutely delicious. And then explore healthier ways to prepare your traditional foods. So if you like meatloaf, it's not that you can't ever have meatloaf. I grew up eating meatloaf the made with red meat. However, I have a great walnut and lentil loaf that I can make that has a lot of that same flavor, um, but that uses plant protein. So look for healthier ways to prepare your traditional foods and just do a Google search or Pinterest and you'll probably find um, like plant-based um, meatloaf and you'll you'll find um, options and then make small changes it's not all or nothing you don't have to tomorrow switch um, you know 100% to do something else but make small changes try to move in the direction of 
of um, eating healthier and eating more in a way that aligns with that Ardmore plate. A second um, issue that people often bring up is preparation and convenience. Look, you, there are healthy meals that only need to be heated. You don't have to, um, you don't always have to prepare everything from scratch. If you, if it's just you and a partner, or if it's just you, look for easy recipes that are, that are just for one or two people. You can search for that as well. Or you can do what I do and you can prepare meals for several days at once. On the weekend, I have more time and I usually bulk cook some food and then I'll freeze some of it so that it's convenient to pull out and thaw at a later time. Um, and it also saves money because I can buy some products in bulk. Um, create a community. If you can find some other people who are working on eating healthier, maybe you cook something and they cook something and then you swap some food, that can be more convenient as well. If it's not a cost consideration, you can buy pre-cut produce or pre-cooked rice and beans. It'll be less expensive if you cook them yourself, but you can buy them pre-cooked if, if um, preparation and convenience is an issue for you. You can order groceries online, have meal delivery services for when I'm short on time. I actually do use a whole food plant-based meal delivery service that I use um, for when I'm tight on time. Uh, food assistance, if you qualify, ask for different options for plant-based sources of protein and healthy options, um, fruits and vegetables, meals on wheels, if you qualify for community centers or SNAP, um, food assistance or food banks, ask them what options there are. Let them know that you're trying to eat in a healthy way that nourishes yourself. And then healthy eating on a budget, it's possible. If you buy and cook in bulk and freeze, that can help with um, with cost, compare costs. So just because you see a couple cans of beans doesn't mean they're gonna be the same price. So so look for look for that and look for BPA free linings if you're if you're buying canned foods. Look for healthy and expensive food options. Once again, do a search on on Google or Pinterest to see what you find. Prepare food yourself. That's often less costly than buying it prepared. You can use canned um, or frozen fruits and vegetables. That can often save money, especially if that those fruits and vegetables aren't in season around you. Look for sales, coupons, use your reward card, and then think about growing a garden if that's something that you would enjoy, or visiting a farmer's market, um, trying a community-sponsored agriculture program, because that can help you with your budget as well. So in closing, try to keep this simple. I know I've shared a lot of information because I get really excited about how nutrition can actually help women's health. And so I love to share the research and dive into that. But for you, try to keep it simple. And I tell people, like, if I just had like one sentence to say, I would say, eat more plants and less junk food. Um, just try to nourish yourself with every bite you take. Try to nourish yourself. Get that whole rainbow. Um, choose foods that look more like they did when they were grown. Um, try to eat um, more plants. Try to eat less processed food. Use that Ardmore plate. Um, but I hope that you're excited. I hope that you're excited about taking some of this that you learned and going out and exploring. Because if it's not joyful, if it's not fun, if it's not delicious, it's it's not going to be a long-term solution for you. You might be able to power through for a while, but Ardmore gives you some great recipes that you can use. So use the Ardmore recipes, use their community, use their resources, make this fun. Um, food is meant to be nourishing. It's meant to add joy to our life. It's meant to, um, it's meant to nourish our mind and our, our body. So keep it simple. Try to incorporate more of these foods. So in closing, this is my family. These are my three kiddos now. Um, and so in closing, my nutrition story is going well. My cancer, um, right now I'm cancer free. I still get really nervous when I have to do tumor markers every three months and do my scans. Oh, I, I don't like that. But right now I am cancer free and trying to live in the moment. I don't know if the foods that I ate when I wasn't eating as healthfully, if they contributed to my cancer, I don't know and I'll never know, but I try not to think about it. I try just to think about what I'm doing now and moving forward and being proud of myself that I'm doing all that I can um, with eating a whole food plant predominant diet to take care of my health. And so I would encourage you to no shame, blame, or guilt. Don't look at what you've done before. Um, no shame, no blame. Just take where you're at today and look at that journey forward. Take small steps. You don't have to do it all at once. If you um, have some foods that aren't if more than 25% of your plate, if that grows one day, um, don't be hard on yourself. Just the next day, the next meal is a new time to nourish yourself. Move forward and try to make food nourishing and a joyful part of your life. So this has become um, one of my main missions in life. My, actually my main, my passion, and what I believe my purpose here in um, on this world is to, to take care of these kids, of my family, and also to share the health message with you and everybody who can listen. 
I um, am part of a nonprofit organization called Paving the Path to Wellness, and I have a book, um, a book with Dr. Beth Frades, who's the lead author, and Dr. Amy Commander, two physicians from Harvard who are um, amazing friends of mine and colleagues. And we have a book. It's a big book, though. It's a big workbook, but a book called Paving the Path to Wellness. It's a workbook. So there's questions, but there's a lot of good information in here that aligns with the Ardmore way of, of thinking um, about eating. So if you want to continue that wellness journey and you want that information, feel free to get this. And um, all the proceeds from the book go to the nonprofit, not to any of the three of us authors. They go to the nonprofit. So that's it. Um, thank you. The chat for everyone. And we'll put awesome. it on the landing page too for the recording so that people can find that. That sounds great. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Amy, for inviting me and Michelle and Ardmore. Um, it's been a pleasure to share this information with you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Tolleson. Um, I know people are asking, where can they get the book? Um, we're putting it in the chat there for you. We're also adding um, uh, other links that Michelle has shared. So like her Twitter and Instagram account um, for the the paving the pathway to wellness. Um, so make sure you you look at those in the in the chat there. And I'm gonna pull up some questions. We had some phenomenal questions. I mean, Good. what you're sharing is just such crucial information for us to know. And it's great to have literature and the science backing and showing these things now um, in such a different variety of ways. So I am going to pull those. Up. So if you have questions, add those in. Um, Michelle Jones with us is going to tag some more of those if they come in. Um, I know we have quite a, a list, but we're going to try to get to as many as we possibly can. So what do you consider a serving of whole grain? That's a good question. Sure. So um, like a slice of bread, um, I would have to look, I don't know if it's a, if it's about a half cup of rice, I want to say, but I'm not positive. I can look that up and get back to you of, uh, exactly what a serving is. Sure. Is it a half cup of rice? I want to know? I wanna say it is. Um, that's one of the things. Uh, the USDA actually has a great nutritional database. You can look stuff like up like that. But we also, in your Full Plate Living um, account, at fullplateliving.org, sign in. You actually have access to a fiber guide. And actually, I have one that I um, have printed off, um, but it actually shares that type of information with you. Oh, so um, you can access that in your full plate living account. There's a fiber guide there that that way, kind of like um, Dr. Hobson, like you were saying, you know, sometimes it's tracking your fiber for a day at least and kind of just seeing where you're at. Um, and that guide can kind of help you do that and see kind of where fiber is coming from and what is a serving size. Great right. question, though. Oh, let's see. Someone's, um, and then she followed up with five servings of whole grains. I believe so. I believe so. Um, once again, I can go back in and verify. I'm not a registered dietitian, so so yeah. So I'm. I think that it's five servings of of grains is the recommendation, but I would need to go back in and, and confirm. Perfect. Perfect. Um, let's see, can people with PCOS and hyperthyroid have soy and its products? If yes, how much is recommended? I am vegetarian. I eat beans and lentils and proteins. I think you kind of uh, ended up actually uh, answering your question. So that was a great question, Nikki, uh, that you had ahead of time. So um, anything yes. else you'd like to add on that? So yes, I've never heard any reason why they can't eat um, soy products. In fact, with PCOS, there's a lot of research around the importance of eating more plant-based proteins, of limiting saturated fat. So that's great that you're vegetarian and that you're eating beans and lentils. There's also a lot of that research on the importance of limiting glycotoxins for PCOS. There's probably a, a connection between um, the glycotoxins with that, that cooked or that charred um, animal products. So, so yes, very, it's great that you're a vegetarian. Um, I don't see any problems with soy products. There used to be a, a, a big concern about eating soy products and their, because they're phytoestrogens and how they do um, interact with the estrogen receptors. And so we used to think, oh, if they're stimulating it, we're going to cause all these different hormonal problems. But they, they actually interact with the receptor in a way that is um, stimulating some and kind of um, blocking others. And so it, it works in a way that's really beneficial for health. And we don't know as much around the soy supplements and the soy isolates. And that's why I really try to steer, steer people away from those and really toward those minimally processed soy foods. So as long as you're not doing the supplements or the isolates and you're sticking with the soy foods, I don't see a problem with that. And I think it would be beneficial. Yeah. The other great thing about, you know, the soybeans, the tempeh, um, those type is that it's actually 75% plate food. So you kind of get to help fill that, that section of your plate. So that's great. Yes. 
Yes. And it's becoming, I mean, there's so, we used to, we used to have to, um, Oh, we have so many resources now that we didn't even a few years ago. I remember having to smash my tofu so that I would drain it with some of the, the moisture. And now we have ultra firm tofu that you can buy at many, at many places. So, I mean, there's so many, so many different options that make eating plant proteins a lot easier and more economical than it, than it was even a few years ago. I mean, it just continues to expand as we see the literature expand, as we see um, the depth and breadth of literature expand. We also see increased patient demand. Um, and then we see prices hopefully come down and op um, options expand. Yeah. Um, we actually had, if um, anyone wants to go back and look at the previous workshops, um, we had a, a, a lady on it that does a lot of different cooking schools and she did a um, lettuce wrap with tempeh that was really good. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's really fun to see all the different things you can do with it and make it so delicious. Yes. All right, this one, um, you know, as some of the questions I know it might be you really need to work with your doctor on some of these, but I'm, I'm still going to bring them up so we can at least touch on sure. them. So I have a rather personal question, um, and that's A-OK, -okay, but um, we'll go ahead and ask it. For the past two years, I have tested for herpes simplex as I am prone to cold sores. The past two tests, 2020, 2021, came back negative. Recently, I experienced the symptoms of a cold sore on my gums uh, where I had recent dental work. I had a test done and as I suspected, HS, um, the HSV1 came back positive. HSV2 still came back negative. Um, we'll have HSV2 only show up if I'm actually experiencing a symptom in the genital area. I am 67 years old. Sure, so um, a, good, a good question. So the herpes simplex virus is a virus that um, that can come up when, during times when we're stressed or come up at other times. So even if it's not the initial outbreak, we can get recurrences of a herpes outbreak. And um, HSV-1, we um, HSV-2 we used to think of as just a genital infection, but you can actually have HSV-1 and 2, you can have it um, orally or genitally. Uh, so, so you can have them either place. Even if you're not experiencing an active outbreak, you can have a blood test that looks for antibodies to HSV-1 and 2. So even if you're not having an active outbreak, you can still have those tests ordered if you um, um, have those tests ordered if you want to know more about that. Sometimes the trauma, um, trauma can be a stressor too that can make a cold sore come up. Um, but one of the things that's really, really exciting is that when we've been talking about COVID and we've been talking about um, about like having those, those outbreaks is doing everything that we can to support our immunity with a whole food plant predominant diet um, is really beneficial. It doesn't mean that you're never going to, to get a breast cancer diagnosis. Does it mean that you're never going to get a cold sore or an outbreak? No, unfortunately it doesn't mean that. But um, if we get an outbreak, we can support our immune system and our health by eating a whole food plant predominant diet. And then hopefully by doing so, we um, also increase our immunity to decrease the chances of us having a recurrence or an outbreak. But I would encourage you to go to go see your doctor and talk and talk to them. Because cool. there's some there's some different treatments and things. So um, there are yeah, medications that you can use to um, decrease the chances of recurrences and then treat if you have an outbreak. Excellent. Yeah. All right, the next one. Can you tell us more about your smoothie prep? Freezing sounds so convenient. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, so I, as a mom of three kiddos, one in kindergarten, um, one in third grade and one in high school. So I need everything I can do uh, to, to make things as easy as possible. So so for smoothies, what I do is on the weekend, my um, my husband and I actually get out our spinach and our frozen blueberries and our frozen strawberries, and we freeze bananas. So when our bananas are really ripe, we peel them and we put them in the freezer. And then what we do is we have, we actually have 14 containers. So we use, um, trying to use glass when possible. You can use plastic, but I try to limit um, plastic on my food, especially if they're cooked. But anyway, for this, we get out 14 containers and each container, we know how much now. So we kind of like measured it out at first, see like how much do we need in our smoothie, in our smoothie container, but we go through and we put spinach in each one, we put, um, or some other greens in each one. We put blueberries in each one. I like blueberries more than my husband does. We were trying to get blueberries, both of us for brain health. Um, then we put, usually put some strawberries in there for a variety, try to get that rainbow, right? He likes more strawberries than I do. So you can kind of do it how you want to. Um, a banana, uh, that's some good prebiotics, the ones that make your um, gut bite microbiome have a party. So we put some bananas in there. Um, ground flaxseed, we buy that and we just put a, a tablespoon or so of ground flaxseed in every container and um, a little bit of vanilla. That's what we like in ours. We put a, just a tiny, tiny bit of vanilla 
And, um, and then my husband, he likes a little bit of agave. So he sweetens his once again, limiting, limiting that amount for me. I like it without, um, but you can, you can see what you like. Also, like he started out with a lot of agave and then over time he's had less and less. And so I think as his taste buds have switched from not eating as much processed food, he's needed less agave. And so we put all of those in our containers, not with any of the liquid. And then we seal them up and we put them in the freezer and then every, you have to have room in your freezer. So first you need to have room in your freezer. So we actually, we actually bought a second we have our um, refrigerator freezer in our kitchen, but we actually bought another freezer that we put, or refrigerator freezer that we have in our garage just because we realized that the economical benefit to being able to freeze food when we cook in bulk sometimes. Um, but then we pull those out and then we just dump that frozen content into our smoothie, the smoothie container and pour the soy milk in. Um, he likes almond milk. I like soy milk, trying to get that soy in. And we pour that in and put the lid on and, and blend it up. Um, if you do do that, if you put the spinach on the bottom of the kind of experiment or sometimes it can get kind of stuck to the bottom, if we put the spinach in first and the other things on top and don't pack it, pack it down. It works really well. Excellent. And it makes it more likely if I can figure out how to fit it into my routine where I'm not pulling out all the ingredients every day, I'm more likely to do it. I have to find ways that make it easy and, and fit into my schedule. Yeah. And lots of great flavors there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I, and mix it up. So like, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing right now. That's my t typical smoothie, but um, you know, you can, you can, th there are a variety of healthy smoothies. So feel free to experiment and see what, see what you like. As I mentioned, my husband, and I like things that are a little bit different and what I'm doing right now, it might, it might change. I always have some leafy greens in it. I always try to do some blueberries, but you know, other berries. Um, so feel free to mix it up and try different things, make it fun. One of the, the things we always, um, a lot of a lot of people just how do they incorporate beans because they don't like beans and smoothies are actually sometimes a great way of doing mm -hmm. that like navy beans yeah. or great northern booze that are really kind of soft mm -hmm. and adding a, a tablespoon or two of those in exactly and experimenting so mm -hmm. think of it like you're doing a taste test you have to see what you like right and so and also like even if you're putting beans and you're like oh i don't know if that's going to change how it tastes and um, maybe try a few and see what it's like or like spinach i know with spinach when i started um, doing uh, spinach and, and greens in my smoothie i worked my way up so i didn't start with as many so um play around to see what works for you it's not all or nothing see if you can keep moving in in that direction. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, I know we have a few more minutes. I want to be very mindful of your time, and I know we still have a lot of questions. So I know a lot of these have already been answered during during the presentation. So um, we will have a recording of this in your membership. Um, so don't worry about if you missed the first half, um, and maybe you feel like your question wasn't answered. But I just want to make sure we kind of get to some of the other ones. Um, let's see. This is an interesting one too. Please talk about getting adequate vitamin A for someone who is a slow converter carotenoids to vitamin A. Um, my dietitian recommended cod liver oil and liver. Thanks. Do you have any recommendations on, on that? Hmm, on vitamin A, I don't, I don't know about slow a slow converter of carotenoids. I do know um, cod, some people do use cod liver oil. I don't, um, and I don't eat, I don't eat liver, but I think that that would be one where I would want to definitely talk with your dietitian and see what, what they recommend. There are certain times when supplementation is absolutely fine. I take a vitamin D supplement, my vitamin D level was low. So I'm not against all supplements. I'm, I'm um, for supplementation or added vitamins or minerals when they are serving a particular purpose. And it seems like, like um, you have a condition where you do need that, or maybe you need to do that cod liver oil and um, and liver. Um, I would say ask for options. A lot of times people will give you, um, will say, you know, you should do do this or that. So it might be that you don't need liver. Maybe you can just do the cod liver oil if you would rather do that. You can ask if there are any plant-based options. So I think that it's good as, um, I guess as, as anyone within the healthcare system, it's good to ask about options because um, because often people don't know, or like even when you're at a restaurant, like for example, if, you're, if you see a recipe that has chicken and you think, I wonder if they could do tofu and said, you can just ask. Um, so when it comes to healthcare, asking what options you have for, for improving or addressing that certain condition. Are there any other ways that I could do it? Or would a supplement be better? Or would it be better with food? I would say ask your dietitian and then follow, follow their guidance. Um, yeah. All right. Agree. All right. Do you take new patients? If no, can you refer me to a like-minded colleague in the Denver area? And I think this goes actually a little bit broader scope too, because um, sometimes people have asked us, can you recommend a doctor? Can you recommend a gynecologist? And, um, you know, what should we look for maybe in a healthcare provider? Um, and if you do know someone in the Denver area, I'll let you uh, <laughs> give Mary Lynn a, a suggestion. 
Sure, sure, sure. So I don't, um, I don't take, I don't take patients right now. So I am just doing the paving the path to wellness. I actually volunteered. I, I'm a professor full time, and I have volunteered at a nonprofit clinic for the over the last decade. Um, and so I saw patients there as a as a gynecologist and women who were trying to get pregnant, and and that whole spectrum looking at women's health and lifestyle medicine. But when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, a little over two years ago, I stopped, um, I stopped seeing patients clinically in that capacity and have switched now to doing the group paving the path to wellness, um, paving the path to wellness groups. So that's my focus right now. As far as finding, as far as finding a physician, um, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, um, ACLM, um, it's a group of over 8,000 healthcare professionals, physicians and, and nurses and um, dietitians and physical therapists and uh, wellness coaches. So I recommend going there and looking at their directory because they have a directory of physicians and they should all be, um, I believe, I believe, I mean, you, each one you need to, to vet for yourself, but they should all hopefully be um, be somewhat knowledgeable in, in a whole food plant-based diet and follow the Ardmore also way of thinking. Um, also, you can also look to see if they have their American Board of Lifestyle Medicine, their ABLM certification. So you anyone can become a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and they're a health professional, they can join, but then there's an actual board certification, the ABLM. And so I'd encourage if you wanna find somebody who's knowledgeable about a whole food plant predominant diet and supporting a healthy lifestyle, I would look for somebody who has that ABLM certification. And then find someone who works with you. I always told patients like, if you, if you, you should be able to ask your doctor questions. Keep, I, I'm a fan of journaling as you, I'm a fan of journaling, whether it's fiber intake or your questions, keep a list of your questions, go in and ask your doctor. If you don't feel comfortable um, with the answers you get, go talk to somebody else. You have choices, you have options, get second opinions, but talk to them, see if they're a good fit. It's you interviewing them to see if they're, if they're right to be your healthcare provider. They should be respectful of your choices, even if maybe they're not following a whole food plant predominant diet, right? Maybe if they're not doing that, they should still be respectful of your, um, of your desire. Realize how little most nutrition, most physicians know about nutrition. So your registered dietitians really are your experts. There are those of us who are trying to learn more, um, but but the dietitians they are truly your experts, especially when it comes to medical conditions. But your physician should at least be respectful of your choices and be willing to say, you know what, I am not sure what a serving of whole grains is, but I'll look it up. So it should be a doctor that will at least say, I am not sure, who's not going to try to make something up, and then who will say, let me go, let me go look look that up and and make sure I give you the right information. So that would be my recommendation for finding for finding a provider. I think that's wise advice for any provider we're looking for <laughs> and we don't always think that you know we should kind of interview them and um, get that type of care that we deserve from what we want so you all deserve it most definitely well dr tellison thank you so much for being with us today i know there are a lot of other questions so um please feel free to join us in the private facebook community if you want to ask them there but um, you know, kind of like we've said here, some of these questions um, can be great questions that you ask your doctor as well, or your dietitian. Mm -hmm. Look for a dietitian, mm -hmm. as, as Dr. Tolson said, that that can be a great resource that you can um, tap into to use. So thank you for being here with us today with Full Plate Living, Ardmore Stoop Health. We are so glad, and I hope you all have a wonderful, blessed day.